Just, just to follow along. Gentlemen here. Yeah, just to follow along. Um, it's the old child isn't it? You know, rectify the terms. Uh, the term social media itself seems to be very inapplicable. Perhaps unsocial media. And, and public media for the stuff. How about private rabbit holes? You know, there has to be a little bit of clarification about terms. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll come back later, Robert. I'll just pick you up on what, on yeah. what you were saying. Question, Jeff. Uh, now I agree with Donald. You know, the, of the possible uses of Facebook. I mean, I think the most brilliant use in taking it in a new direction was Peter Wells earlier this year, who documented documented this last day. He was dying. We had this conversation, extraordinary conversation, online with people, and that to me is it was a real revelation in terms of what social media can do. But but and I'm a great user of Facebook. Facebook, but you know, sort of shared doubts about it. One doubt is, and it's one that I've heard expressed quite a lot at the moment, is in terms of taking down content in Facebook, they're very quick to take down a contravention of copyright, particularly music. Why can it move so swiftly on other content? Mm. Um, well, I mean, I can't give you an answer. I can say that that's one of the main things I've been thinking about in terms of because I mean. Donald was talking about how it's important to be fair when we're talking about this and you know not just scapegoat these social media companies. So there are some, I've noticed in some news reports for instance when we talk, when they talk about stopping this kind of thing from ever happening again, stopping you know someone from being able to just stream an, an atrocity again, the, the language always tends to be they need to do something. Um, and it's very easy to say someone should do something. But um, when we're talking about taking down these videos much quicker, making sure that they can't just keep spreading. We can identify something you can do. As you say, these these uh, songs that aren't licensed get taken down immediately because AI can pick up on the song. Uh, that video has an audio file. I see no reason why we shouldn't be able to program something that can recognize that, that video is what's being uploaded and immediately stop it from going out. Um, so I, I agree with you, I guess is what I'd like to say. I, just to, to add to that, I think a really key thing that's coming out in the debate about that video, and I have no technical skills on this, um, uh, is a kind of loss of trust um, in, if there was trust, but lessening of trust in Facebook's capacity to, uh, to create that safe environment which it claims to create for, for people's social activities. I think that's really significant um, uh, and is a, you know, is a, is a good is a good thing. It's uh, putting the pressure on on them to uh, to shape the their environment um, in different ways than their commercial logics at the moment. So, yeah. Question here. Uh, just following on from your point, so uh, the, the past week has been quite interesting watching I, my three children reacting, um, and you know they're just soaking up, reading everything, and getting quite emotional, um, and. Uh, yeah, just I was trying to guide them to you know uh, analyze what they're reading, how old is it, where does it come from, but there must be a lot who are not getting guided through the process as well and becoming maybe ill through the process as well, and uh, so education must play a part. And don't completely trust Facebook, don't mm. trust Instagram. Uh, ed educate yourself uh, and question as you. Uh, can I just pick up on that because this is the, the video someone sent me that via messenger and it said it was a client actually I've just been sent this have a look at this now I'm very careful with what I look at but it was someone I know and know well and I trusted them so I started it and I watched the first six seconds and I stopped it immediately my husband who's a big hairy builder on a building site down the road his team on the building site all watched it. Rob refused to, because he had heard about it already. Our son, 16, watched it from beginning to end. And I'm really upset about that. I've talked to him about it and said, how are you? What did you think? And he's been really, um, he's a 16 year old boy and you know, I'm bulletproof. There's nothing wrong, there's not a problem. I saw it, it wasn't a problem. 
So trying to have those conversations, so that's three really different kind of responses within the same family. And when I've tried to have a conversation with him about it, it's very hard to get across the things that you've, the guidance that you want to give them. And so I'm totally lost on how I should do that or how I can do that. Mm. I've talked to him about his friends and said, watch your friends, see if your friends are struggling with it, and tried to give him a sense of responsibility around them as well to see if I can get through to him that way. But my goodness, you know, we're, we're old and ugly enough that you'd think we'd be able to help with that guidance after all those years, but I'm at a loss. Mine mm. watched it before the end of the lockdown at school. Mm. What? Right. Oh, lordy. So what, what would be considered a safe environment? Because as you said, you were talking about a safe environment. But honestly, I don't see a safe environment on social media. So how do we create one? Yeah, uh, and I didn't. I was putting that in kind of scare okay. quotes okay, because that's, that's Facebook's fine. desire by taking out, you know, sexualized um, you know, nudity and uh, um, aggressive talk and, and so on. Um, but it's clearly failing. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. Well, Just one, one thing to. I'm sorry, you talk. Yeah, no, uh, no, I was going to go off topic. So. Right. Okay. Um, we have an organisation, NetSafe, which is very mm. focused on the care of individuals in a digital environment. And perhaps this is a, a chance to think about: Do we need, um, you know, kind of uh, not so much just a safe, you know, or, organisations committed to a safe environment, but to uh, a good, uh, the public good uh, on the net, um, where. You know, if we individualise the responsibility not to look at particular videos, um, and the conversation mm -hmm. that we're having now is about it's, that's not not enough, and clearly we don't have the, the safeguards. It's impossible to safeguard yourself against those videos. So, yeah. Yes. Yes, so I can add to that a bit, Don, because we NetSafe already have a duty and a role under the Harmful Digital Communications Act. Mm -hmm to under um, 10 or 11 principles, harmful digital communications principles, which would cover all of the sort of thing we're talking about. Um, and there's a criminal offence set up under that act and there is a civil process whereby you can go and complain to um, Net, NetSafe to um, ask them to mediate for you. Um, so there's, there are already plenty of um, areas where um, some of this is is capable of being dealt with at the moment, but we could certainly. I don't. To add to what you said about, we're not saying let's let's get rid of Facebook or Facebook shouldn't exist or whatever. You've got to find ways of um, working at all the areas of law or regulation that can and education that can work together. I mean, one of the problems I think with getting 16-year-old boys to maybe not look at the video or see it in a different light are they. They have access to very violent computer games at the moment, which we actually have a classification office that classifies those those games for use by those young men for hours in their bedrooms if they wish. So it's across society, you know, all areas of media, not just um, the obvious ones that, that we've started to talk about in relation to to the shootings and, and so on recently, but um, uh, in order to be consistent and to be able to educate our young people, or everybody, Generally, we have to be. We have to look across media. Generally, I think. Around. From a legal perspective, though, where do you draw that line? I mean, I hate banning things. I'm all for yeah. personal responsibility yeah. and being able to apply a, a rational decision-making process for individuals. So, yeah. so where do you draw that line, and what is the bar at the moment as to what is objectionable and what is not, and what is acceptable and what is reasonable? Yeah, yeah. the um, the chief classification officer has has banned the video yeah. as objectionable and my reading of the um, legislation around that which is long and complex because as soon as you give state servants power to censor anything you have to try and be as clear as possible about it and be as restrictive as possible about it and require that freedom of expression be taken be balanced we take a balancing approach in New Zealand to yeah. to these different rights and, and needs Does suicide get censored? Pardon? Does suicide get censored? I've noticed that in Christchurch, quite a lot of people who don't even know someone that dies post about suicide, so is that censored? Because I think that's an issue in Christchurch as well, which I've noticed. Our families get affected when hundreds of people obviously don't know their child say, oh, we feel sorry for this child, but that's just, they shouldn't be posting that because they don't personally know the person. So is that censored in Christchurch? Um, posting on. No. 
Yeah, no, no, it's certainly not, wouldn't. Um, that sort of that discussion would not be. No. In, in terms of media coverage of yeah. suicide, there are quite strict um, guidelines yeah, around yeah. that. But in terms of social media comments, yeah. that doesn't tend to fall under the yeah. existing kind of structures yeah. that are in place. And, and I think too, building on what uh, Ursula said, is that with the, the Harmful Digital Communications Act and NetSafe, that's really targeted at individuals, mm -hmm. and you have to actually have contact details of that other person before yeah. NetSafe will engage. And, and sort of also around the gaming thing, there was an article possibly in the Herald or on the spin-off uh, around gaming culture, and as a gamer some years back myself, um, there is that subculture there, and those kind of things are very hard to police, and that comes back to that societal issue of, of calling out things that you think are harmful, and that's that balancing that the government agencies deal with, is freedom of speech versus what could cause demonstrable harm to society wider, and it, 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 there's no easy answers. And that's the idea of glorifying suicide. I don't want to say we've glorified it, but post-legal media so much kind of glorifies that, and that's why we're so in sync with Japan, because Japan, ever since Samurai, Samurai used to have glorified suicide. So uh, Japan's highest suicide rates, I can see how it relates to Christchurch, because uh, we don't have any sensory in terms of well, for myself, I personally don't post anything about that sort of thing, but uh, I can see that we need to teach it to children, maybe, or just teach it to the right age, obviously, but uh, it's a problem, and uh, then you ask yourself, how do we fix this problem? <laughs> uh, it's a lot harder than you. I think you're raising some really important questions about media literacy here. Mm -hmm. about our own, our own wisdom. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I don't know your name. But uh, Chris. Chris raised a really interesting point as well about the current regulatory framework. Kind of te treating us as informed consumers. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're individualised. We're, we're taught to, to take our own responsibility. Yeah. So now, the, the, but the flip side of that is, do, do you want the state checking all your social media yeah. messages to make sure you're not spreading messages about, for example, suicide? Yeah, that's, that's complicated. Now, now, we have a question here, then a question at the back, then you sir, then you sir. Um, I'm from Jaina, I'm the one with the musical microphone. <laughs> um, Peter, you sort of talked about um, suggestions for regulations um, for social media, and I just wanted to ask what our panellists thought, if they thought one of them was particularly good, or, or if you had your own ideas about um, regulations that we could use on, on top of the framework that we already have, like, like you'd say. Can you repeat the question, so I just... Can you repeat well, the question? Uh, what, did what, did what you all hate my question? ideas? Uh, <laughs> well, for me, no. Um, I remember back when I was at Māori TV, which was, feels like ages ago then, but we had OMSA, which had kind of started, and then most of the ones who were involved got booted. <laughs> from the organisations we represent, not Buddha, but you know. Um, so, so I kind of fell away from it. But also it was a real clear attempt from, I think it was us and the NZME, Media Works, or whatever it was at the time, TV3, uh, and a couple of others, to try and set up a framework and also a, the potential of a regulatory position or a regulator um, to deal with standards and particularly around our, our organisations. Now, where that ended up, I couldn't tell you because I, I walked away from it not long after that. Um, so, so to come back to Peter's point, I, I do agree with the idea of it, how that gets formulated, what you put around it is a really good question, but I think the idea has some merit and that's what we were talking about pre-2014, but I don't know where it is now. It's, it's gone, it lasted about two years, mm -hmm. right, but the right. New Zealand Media Council has taken over that, right. that role. That, for the news story. But see, that, that was an attempt, that was a proactive attempt from us, yeah. um, because we knew that we, and, and there are lots of cases at the time around particularly around people who identify for personal attack, who were in the media, or potentially stories that we were doing where those particular people who were involved in those stories also started be being personally attacked as a result of the stories that we were doing, which really set up the conversations that, that we had at the time. And, and there was real frustration with uh, potentially some of what BSA was doing that wasn't dealing with what we needed to deal with. What became really interesting later on was we had ones like Whale Oil that wanted to be members of OMSA, which really threw us in a bit of a predicament, mm -hmm. and we didn't have really time, I wasn't there long enough to be able to see how that ended out. But that also became an issue for us. So, so long story short is I think there's, my view is there's some merit in the idea, what framework you put around that, what else you had to support that, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
when you say regulation, you're talking uh, specifically more, I guess, about content that's posted as opposed to the sort of advertising. Yeah. Um, I mean, my personal opinion, again, I mean, I, I'll try and admit this the last time I say this, but I can't claim to be an expert on it, so I don't, don't like to feel like I'm talking out of school. But um, my general feeling is that, I mean, with, with extreme stuff like that video, we already have laws where, you know, now it's illegal to distribute mm -hmm. it, so that's all, that kind of thing is already taken care of. Um, we also already have laws in terms of, um, what would you say, hate speech would be the correct, you know, yeah. um, deliberately inciting hatred toward that kind of language. So it's not necessarily in Facebook's platform, although it actually might be, but even if Facebook technically allows it, our laws already don't, so you would be in trouble for distributing that kind of thing through Facebook. My instinct tends to be, I, I think that's about right, because I don't... Um, I understand why people want to regulate and curtail upsetting material. Um, it's just a matter of what is the language that ends up getting drafted and what then falls under upsetting material. I mean, you were talking before about, you know, is sending well wishes to people, you know, who have been victims of suicide. Should that be censored because it could be distressful? Mm. Um, you know, I tend to think no. And, um, it, Regulations can be drafted with very broad language and, you know, be used in the wrong way and have the outcomes that we didn't intend. So mm -hmm. I, I tend to be very conservative about that. Yeah, for me, uh, responsibility is a word that I think um, the Prime Minister used in Parliament to talk about it, Facebook, that you, uh, you, you can't make $64 billion of profit without having any responsibility for the content mm -hmm. that's being shared around the world. Um, uh, and responsibility is at multiple levels. So at an individual level, you know, don't don't share photos of a of a nude celebrity who's had her phone hacked. Um, don't uh, at the level of the platform. Uh, and I think that's best dealt with by education personally, and, and maybe net safe and kind of particular harassment cases and, and so on. At the level of the platform, I like um, Peter's idea that and I think as happens in Germany, as I was hearing Aaron said on the way in, the, you get a massive fine if you. Um, uh, are responsible for distributing um, a certain kind of, of hate speech um, and I think fines work quite well with companies like, like that. Um, at the next level the government has a responsibility, uh, ISPs have a responsibility um, and how you balance up all those responsibilities is, is quite hard. Um, who gets the fine? Is it the individual who posts on Facebook or is it Facebook? You'd have to ask the German government, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, who, who should get the phone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the company... It's a government scheme. The government will be. No, it's, it's private when you impose in that yes. way. Yeah. But in the last week, there's some quite cool satire that's come out, which could possibly be look at being, they're being mean towards Donald Trump. Mm. Or whatever. But it's satire. And, and see, that's the interesting mm. issue here for me, is... What is reasonable to one person is very unreasonable to someone else, and it's around interpretation. And it's one thing to now have the regulation dealing with the Facebook uh, and and other social media dissemination of the video after the fact, but you can't stick the genie back in the bottle. So as the issue's already been raised, you know, if they can do it with music, why can't they do it with us? So we've got to look at regulation at the point of the dissemination and not after the fact. The damage, in my opinion, I'm sure it might have been. Uh, reduce somewhat, but the damage has been done a lot of it. Um, I mean, in radio, we have a delay. We have a delay and dump. So, I don't know, do we look at some sort of delay and dump through live streaming, perhaps, or through a social media system? That might be something. Yeah, but is a person going to have to sit there and man that? I well, mean, that's the other you know, issue, you know. Yes, no, no, no I, I, I totally agree, oh, but yeah. I mean, they, they're doing it in <laughs> Germany. They have people in Germany, and Ch China is a, an obvious one as well. There's stuff being monitored all the time there. But it is about interpretation, so you've got the video being dealt with, but you've also now got the manifesto. So you've got Stephen Franks' group coming out and saying, well, if you start banning the manifesto, you then aren't informing people as to what the decisions on banning videos and other hate speech is based on. So you're limiting people's ability to educate themselves and understand. So where do you draw the line and where does stuff become censorship? and unrealistic and unreasonable censorship as opposed to protecting society. And that's the discussion that I think we need to be having. And I don't know whether you can ever win that one, to be honest. Yeah. Or whether I think there's a degree of responsibility on the part of the news media to ask a fundamental question, is this a useful contribution to the debate? 
Now, there's a tendency in New Zealand news media to take all comers, free, free speech, they might call it. But I would ask the question, who are you representing? Sensible, sensitive trust. Mm -hmm. How many people there do you represent? And this Coalition for Free Speech, which I agree should be renamed Coalition for Muddy Thinking, are they adding anything to the debate? Ask that question. But you no, may think not. no, and mm. someone else may think yes. Well, yeah. well we don't speech. know. Is yeah. free speech just in a nation or a worldwide free speech that we want? And that's a question that we have to bring to our nation. So you've got obviously uh, international free speech, then you have sovereign free speech, sovereign state. So what free speech do we want to apply? Do we want to take into consideration other countries around us when we think of free speech? So we need to think culturally it needs to be responsible as well, right? We want to not offend the Muslims, do we? So well, that's is this free speech, we still haven't fixed it, have we? You, that's you, why we had these threats because we don't have free speech as a top priority. I think you've identified a good paradox there, which, which is that under Article 19 of the International Declaration of Human Rights, we actually all do have the right to communicate yeah. freely across borders without restrictions. So we yeah. Well, well the only thing universal it about it is that it's universally <laughs> violated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so there's a question at the back, yeah, and then well, you, sir. And uh, one of the things, though, is how on earth do we ever cope without live streaming? And this has been foisted on us as a feature, mm -hmm. a lovely feature that uh, Facebook yeah. has um, uh, given us. Yeah, and we don't know how to handle it. You know, the, the technology is there, and suddenly we're, we're trying to react to it and, and control it. But it's not control. It's a thing that we're dealing with now that there is no point in putting laws out, out there to try and control it. It, it's out there, and then we're dealing with the aftermath of it. So while you're responsible broadcasters with standards and abilities uh, are being held to account um, because you've broken a law of uh, standards and things like that, but when you live stream it, you're basically a little TV channel, mm -hmm. completely unregulated, and it's too late. It's got out there, and if we're relying on an algorithm to catch it, good luck with that because mm -hmm. it's just you know a bit yeah. of technology, and that's not guaranteed. All. So I just wanted to add that back into mm -hmm. the mix. Why do we have live streaming? Just then. It's Just funny. get rid of it. It's, it's an un, unwanted blight on our society. There's something to discuss. <laughs> well, you said, um, oh, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, I use it in my work a lot. <laughs> so, you know, if but you're accountable and, and, and know about it. You, you, you might get the license to. Oh, I see, so you could license it. Yeah. If, okay. if you had a five minute delay, would that make a difference? <laughs> Well, um, I, I, sorry, no, you... you oh, I, was yeah, just gonna, I was just going to say, as a really quick note, you said, can we live without live streaming? It reminded me of a um, formerly popular comedian, uh, Louis C.K.'s line, it's amazing how the world owes you something you only knew existed five seconds ago. Um, you know, you get Wi-Fi on a plane, you never have Wi-Fi on a plane your whole life, they take Wi-Fi on the plane away, it's a fucking outrage. <laughs> um, and it's the same with live streaming. Live streaming is what? It's certainly been a big thing on social media for five years, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but like now the idea of taking it away, honestly, I, no, I don't think people would stand for it. Do you think that not having live streaming would have stopped this particular murderer or the Norwegian um, example that he obviously worshipped? There's a lot of other issues besides the overt murder and mayhem, which have to be addressed. I'd be interested in terms of the gaming thing. You know, if, if there could be any research, which there could be, if the people who did were exposed almost accidentally to those images being broadcast live or rebroadcast in ways which were hard to take down, uh, how people uh, viewed that who had watched or played lots of games. You know, was there some desensitisation, blah, blah, blah? I don't know. I just saw on the BBC today that something, the guy who wrote the report on no links between yeah. gaming mm -hmm. and uh, violence, he added a wee codicil, yes. which is now being yes. amplified, <laughs> saying, however, however, uh, it'd be worth following up what happens because in those, in those rabbit holes, people are exposed to another kind of culture and conversation. Yeah. As the Australian gunman was exposed to at the Milton rifle range, and those less than overt things are the real issues in terms of education and whatever about handling of sources and how these things work. So it's not just the overt thing over here, it's the whole range of Canadian visiting speakers talking about, um, you know, 
white stuff, but, but in less than uh, powerful ways. These are all very distorting. So how do you deal with the, the, the education thing as a parent, uh, as media people, as teachers? Okay, it's a question at the back. Sorry, sir. Uh, so, so a lot of great points so far. Um, I had a quick thought about the about this problem of live streaming, and it's related to my main point, which I'll which I'll then put it to, uh, which has to do with uh, how we imagine social media as a public media. So, trying to have conversations about should we get rid of live streaming, should it be a, a, a available or not, that presumes that we have democratic control and ownership of this space. And the technology of streaming, trying to get rid of that would be akin to trying to get rid of HTML, which is the technology that lets you read text on web pages, or trying to get rid of the ability to, to print uh, uh, artist renditions of uh, Canvas on, on paper. You know, it's, it's a way of transmitting media. The problem isn't so much that we have the ability to transmit that media, but that there is an appetite for it in our poisonous culture. And that's, that's, that's something that unfortunately is much harder um, to, to tackle directly. But if the, the question is really, do we have the ability to control the rule book, of, uh, the rule book that governs how these um, social media operate? And the answer is, and this is my main sort of point, which is no, which we have to think very straightforwardly about ownership and control. And the fact of the matter is, Facebook is owned by a corporation that's headquartered in San Francisco that profits off of minimizing the amount of money it pays its workers to disseminate uh, primarily advertisements, to, to, to take a cut off of advertising money when people buy things every day. And insofar as its other functions are related to that or not, that is how it determines what its rule book is for who sees what how it decides what poisonous content is, which by the way is, is awful because if you've ever read any of these articles, they, they employ subcontractors around the world, offices of people who are getting paid as little as they are, can get away with, to literally have to watch poisonous content all day, every day. It's taking a terrible toll on their on their well-being, and they're harnessed by, they have non-disclosure, so they're not allowed to actually talk openly about what they see every day and how it operates. So it's a very toxic culture, and it, and it stems from the fact that this is it, it's corporate owned. And so, to imagine that we have, we can tackle it to some degree with legislation. If you're, if you're fortunate uh, to to have that that tool at your disposal, but what would we do if we could if we could push that energy into creating our own? Uh, democratic social media, which is entirely separate from Facebook, and why haven't such efforts succeeded so far? And I think they will. They're going to in our lifetimes. It's going to be a very slow and difficult process, but the technology exists, and we have protocols that have much more fine-grained control over the rules uh, and the ownership of these networks, and we have open source protocols which allow engineers to write software that achieves the same functions of things like Facebook, but in a much more honest way. And social media would be very different if we actually had real control over it. For Can I push back a little bit on that? Can I push back a little bit though? I, I'm very wary of, um, and this is, I don't really have a political colour at all, okay? But I'm very wary of painting big corporates as the big bad guys in this. There are big corporates out there who are very, very responsible. There are big corporates out there who are not, and you've mentioned one and we know very well what Facebook is doing and where they are irresponsible. So I don't necessarily think by making this a public owned or democratic type of um, organisation as far as social media and dissemination of information goes, is going to sort the problem. I, I, I would question that. That's, yeah, it's that's really interesting. It's the same debate that we've had in relation to to many uh, large, large corporate controlled products, including media. Um, you know, there's no obligation for us all to drink Coca-Cola. Um, and the more critical knowledge you have about the company and the more knowledge you have about uh, the health impacts and, and so on, the more you can make an informed choice. Mm. And so education is really important, as is a plurality, mm. um, having a range of social media platforms, particularly ones like you're talking about, which will operate, I think, by different structural logics. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. So let yeah. me just let me just flesh out the rest of my thinking on this, so, and, and make it just an invitation. 
conversation to, to sort of uh, contribute thoughts. But the uh, when when you say, especially I'm American, if you haven't guessed. So if you if, where I'm from, if you say something should be publicly on, you get a lot more skepticism than you're going to get in New Zealand, and I admire that uh, immensely. But at the same time, the, the the uncertainty associated with something that's centrally controlled is very real. So that's to be clear, that's not what I'm proposing. What I'm suggesting is that the way forward is going to be very grassroots driven, and it's not going to involve passing legislation of one kind or another at a, at a particularly high level necessarily. What it'll start with is communities who have a specific need that's not being met currently by what's out there, and that could be a place where poisonous uh, conversations are not tolerated, and we have a place where people can you can put a rule on your profile that says, I don't participate in poisonous conversations, and you can make the rules so that you're able to cultivate and curate your connections in a very real way that's, that's parallel with the way you cultivate your human connections in real life. So you, you do that. You could also do, say, certification for who's good at building and who wants to help me next Sunday with my project at home. There's an unlimited, you know, the people's own Uber, right? Uber is, is a great idea. But people should be able to control their wages, and people could do that at a local level with small, innovative tweaks to existing open source protocols and many different versions of a social network existing in a, in a very geographically tied place. It's, it's just, it's a creative act, not a legislative or an administrative one. So you're, 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 you're proposing, well, I'm more clarifying than responding, you're proposing sitting up alternative platforms and popularizing them rather than regulating and changing the existing platforms? Is that well, in a nutshell? There will be regulation for sure, but I don't think that we're going to see the kind of really sea change in culture that is possible with a uh, creative grassroots driven process. And I think that I think that the possibility is there and I think it's coming, yeah. um, but it's very sort of, you know, in the early stages and it's hard to envision right now, but I think, you know, we're going to be moving <coughs> Can I maybe add to that? I think that's the idea of cultural <coughs> and drastic. So we would take into consideration the idea of lunch, uh, live streaming. Maybe that wasn't gradually introduced into society in the right way, therefore we could take it more dramatically. So I think the, more, the, the main thing, as you said, is small. We need to introduce it in small quantities to more of a gradual influence into society rather than throwing something at our faces. I think, I think, not saying it's right I think there's some interesting tensions here between developing alternative social media that you know somehow evolves organically from the community you know, without somehow buying into the algorithms and codes that are, that are currently corporate to, you know the it's proprietary intellectual property in many cases so I, I, I wonder if we actually need to to in a sense you know re, reclaim the web as, as Tim berners Lee has been suggesting quite recently you know, to actually go back to some fundamentals and say, well, where did all this start? And that's the natural uh, way of thinking. Well, it, uh, it, it'd be nice if it was. I don't know if it is. We, do, uh, <laughs> so, we have a, a prize winner who has a question. <laughs> Jasper. Um, well, yeah. Back to the live streaming thing. It's just, because um, with live streaming, everyone's kind of given a platform, even people that really shouldn't have one. But instead of getting rid of it, I feel like it should be limited to certain people who do, you know, have a like, you know, proper voice. And um, kind of like the way Twitter works with their verified system, how they have a little blue tick next to their name, kind of the people with that would be able to live stream instead of everyone being able to live stream whatever they like. Because it's kind of hard to have an automated system to recognize mm -hmm. half the content. Oh, I can have I a problem with that. Okay. That's yeah. very um, 1984, I can see that being you know, who makes that decision, yeah. uh, you know, if one person is allowed and one isn't. I, I, you know, the issue is, is not so much, I think, about giving the individuals the, the blue tick, if you like. It's, it's making sure that whoever wants to, within the current regulations and laws that are there, can do it, but there are protections in place. And I think that's the kind of system that we need to look at. Do we look at a five to ten minute delay dump? Do we look at uh, uh, algorithms that are more finely tuned and able to pick these things up, but I would be very wary of yeah. allowing that person, but not that person, to be allowed to do it. I, I agree, not for the fact that I don't have a blue sick and yet my cousin does. <laughs> um, how they got one, I don't know. Um, and I can't understand why someone who only tweets about the Hurricanes games doesn't get a blue tick. But anyway, um, but so I, I agree with you, um, because I would have some concern about that as well. 
the, the, the other point I would say though is having had the meetings that we've had over the last week with the Muslim community, what, what has become very clear to us is our inability to engage with that community well over time and the lack of diversity of voices that we, we have had in a public media service uh, for a long time. Um, I've been, and I, oh, look, I'll say it, I think the media has done a, actually a really good job over the last week and two days. I think the media has done an amazing job. Um, but previously, we have not allowed the proliferation of different voices on it in our public media sphere. And I, th I think that's an initial first step that, that has to be really seriously looked at. Because until we allow that diversity of voices in a really meaningful way to have the, the, the engagement, to have the conversations around this kind of thing, um, then, I, then I think we're essentially doing our communities at a service. I do agree with the community-led approach in some way, shape, or form. You know, Ngāi we, we have five frequencies over the South Island. Um, you know, we have, we have a, a station based in, in, in Christchurch. Um, you know, both in the earthquakes and with the Muslim community and, and the tragedy that we've had, very uh, quick engagement with those communities really, really um, vastly affected. We're a community organisation in all for, uh, intents and purposes. Um, and again, we, we haven't, in a community sense, done well in trying to get that community voice done uh, either from a local perspective. So I think I agree that there needs to be some community way of developing something that enables more voices to become prevalent within our local communities and also nationally as well. And then the last thing that I'd say about um, coming back to the technology, look, I, I think that um, live streaming for us is a really important way of just doing really basic things like a poor hitty at a barang, mm. which for us is news. I mean, for most people, it's just boring stuff about Mary's talking in Māori and, <laughs> and acknowledging you know, those who passed on for half an hour. But for us, that we love that. Right? And so if you try and put that genie back in the bottle somewhat, you're going to get a reaction, particularly from communities like ours. Mm. But I do think thinking about different ways, of whether it's a delay and dump or whether it's a you know, a greater technology um, in whatever shape or form, to be able to measure that out, modify that in some way would be really good. Trying to pick it back right now, I think, would be really difficult. Getting back to how you would do that, though, to actually create or get uh, media to be more, show more diversity, effectively, um, how, would you, how would you actually make that happen? Would you just rely on those large media to voluntarily do it, or would you have a regulation? Or would you encourage more non-commercial media? Because we know commercial media likes homogenisation because it helps ratings. Diversity doesn't rate. And in large scale, which is what NZB and stuff and TVNZ want. So how would you propose changing that? Uh, well, we, we have media agencies that are funded effectively by the Crown. Right? They, have a, they are constituted in particularly Māori television is um, you know, funded to give diversity of voice to the public. And yes, it has an outcome of language and culture, but it's effectively about giving diversity of voices to the wider community. Um, we have another a whole bunch of other uh, media organisations that are funded in the same way to do exactly the same thing. Generally, I think they do a pretty good job. In terms of commercial radio or commercial platforms or whatever it is, oh, that's a hard fight, right? I get that. But um, I've seen a bit of that over the last week. We certainly saw it on Saturday, the day after these tragic events, where lots of people who have tried to amplify their voices on these kinds of issues previously suddenly had a change of tune. Mm -hmm. Now, my concern is, is that that will only last for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then we go back to the way we were yeah. one and a half weeks ago. But actually, yeah. I don't think it's only about ethnicity, because this is another issue. No, and no, I think, no, no. you know, for example, women in media. Yeah. Um, and, and my God, if you're over 40, forget it. And, 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 the, and the issue is that, that, that women who are 40, women who have families and, and women who, um, you know, 50s, have got a lot to bring and a perspective to bring to broadcasting that they should be bringing. I want to see that reflected in media because that's me as well and that's Urson and, and a number exactly of you here. Point. You that's know? what you get on RNZ. There's lots of women of all ages, whereas on the commercial media, not so much. So how would you propose change? 
Well, I was going to say maybe someone could start a social media campaign. Cause, um, and look, I'm, I say that flippantly, but there, there is a way to do that as well. I don't know the answer to that. When I've seen media in Australia, for example, I see a far greater diversity, particularly with women, uh, in media reporting, that they're bigger women, they're older women, they're ethnically diverse as well, and I see that in the UK a bit. And look, when I look at television, particularly in New Zealand, I hate to say it, but I get those journos mixed up. You know, they are... 20 to 30 and they're blonde and I don't mean to sound disparaging because some of them are very very good at what they do but for God's sake I want to see um, myself and my friends and, and other women reflected in, in what I'm seeing not only in a journalist but but in a host I mean Hilary Barry I enjoy too but my goodness as soon as she gets a few more wrinkles she'll be out when I was doing telly for example so I was 19 and they tried to make me look 22 by putting my hair up and putting me in big shoulder pads you know because the older you were the more um, people tended to believe what you said, but you know, have we got any women with grey hair on television? We have a lot of, well you've we got um, Mike McRoberts for example, so there's a wisdom attached to grey haired men on television, and there's uh, an old lady thing Kim attached to example. women, yeah well Kim's on, oh yeah it's an example of yeah. being on telly and they're coming off, yeah. there might be other reasons there, I mean Kim, yeah well anyway let's not go there, <laughs> <laughs> I love her by the way. Just, just coming back to the spotlight which I think is appropriate given the last reason, you know, uh, happenings, tragedy, you know, on the religious sort of cultural and the other voices, can I just raise a question here because the easy targets of visiting Canadian duos and others that picked on were the multicultural, the UN, all that sort of stuff. Can I just ask you a tough question? You know, given over the last you know, decades the emphasis in New Zealand on biculturalism, which I applauded, but are we at a stage now that that actually is a bit of a constraint mm -hmm. in terms of Muslim voices? Now that's a religious thing but also other ethnic groups. I suspect that a lot of people, um, I know, you know, friends of a sex and who, who struggle with the, the albert or being accepted. It, it, is it time to reframe the bicultural dialogue? Can we let the panel respond? Yeah. Julie, do you um, well, let me give an example of a model that I think works really well, is e -tangata. E Tangata. So E Tangata produces every Sunday a whole bunch of articles written by a whole bunch of different people, uh, led by Tapu Misa, for, former journalist, or she could still be a journalist actually, uh, and Gary Wilson. Uh, none of them Māori. <laughs> and yet the amount of Māori stories that these guys produce on every Sunday is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you talked about women over 40, one of the key contributors in E Tangata is Moana Maniabot, amazing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet still has um, community contributors, uh, whether it be Māori, women, um, um, even Muslim contributors, before um, what happened on Friday, March 15. So rather than trying to get into a deeper, dark conversation, or not deeper, dark conversation, a deeper conversation around biculturalism or multiculturalism, I think what, what I've seen is that there are actually really good uh, models that exist now um, with, which actually allow diversity of voice, whether it be gender, religion, ethnicity, um, that can actually contribute in a much more meaningful way, I think, to the body scholarship around a whole bunch of issues that we've been using in society. So that exists at the moment. I'll tell you another one that's really actually good is, is community radio. Community radio has a plethora of voices from within, you know, so I, I know from Māori radio, for example, a great example is Radio Ngāti Pro. There's a, if you, if you can go on Google, there's Radio Ngāti Pro, based in Rotorua, where someone stole a generator from, I think it was St. James. <laughs> the commentary provided around that was, was amazing. Now, yes, these are community issues, and they put a whole bunch of community people in. They weren't just Māori, they were, you know, others as well. But, but there, are, there are really good examples where I think that diversity of voice is available, is broadcast, and potentially we don't shine enough light on those ones that do really well, number one. But, but secondly, they are good models for us to follow. The, the rubber hits the road where you start looking at the big court, sorry, the big commercial entities and whether we can, uh, as a result of what has happened and seen in the, in the days immediately after that, continue for that kind of diversity of thought to extend past what's immediately in front of us at the moment, um, given what's happened. Because I think there can be a longer term uh, outcome 
based on what we've seen over the last couple of days. Whether it happens or not is, is really kind of up to us and the rest of the country. Whether we can continue allow, can continue to, to push those commercial, really big commercial engines to be able to keep doing it. Can I just add very briefly to that thing? Um, I think we don't need to see biculturalism, multiculturalism as, as competing in Māori broadcasting. I think has, I think has set the, the scene for uh, a, a more multicultural broadcasting environment rather than competing. But I, I don't. We could have a discussion about that. I've got a little question about that, and, and that and that would be: is 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 there a need not only to situate the conversations and the dialogues, you know, for example, in and around you know, the Māori community? on Māori media is, is the critical thing to bring that conversation mm -hmm. into the mainstream. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll link that to a comment about you know, the situation that I think we see in the case of the representation of the Islamic community. I, mean, I think there's an awful lot of people in New Zealand and, and other countries who I mean, they may know Muslims but they probably haven't actually had conversations or personal dealings with them in a way that would actually allow them to say that they really mm -hmm. understand the culture. And the problem that I see is that, and I actually had a student that, that look, looked at this in, in the New Zealand media context, is that the, the, the representations of Islam and Muslims you know, in the mainstream New Zealand media tend not to be about the local community. Because there's you know, maybe occasionally a cultural festival, maybe some, something that happened that they get in the news for, but there's nothing really terrible goes on. You know, overseas, of course, you know, we, we get references to Islam and, and, and Muslims in all sorts of contexts, but they're nearly always negative. You know, it's when there's been a bombing that someone links to Islamic extremism, or it's to do with ISIS or Al-Qaeda. And in the absence of a reference point, you know, to, to, to what, what do I know about Muslims, I think it's quite tempting to go with the media representations we've seen. But the ones that are happening internationally have nothing to do with what's going on in the local community here. So uh, I, I, think, I think one of the problems is that the, the, um, until the, just over a week ago, the Muslim community in New Zealand was largely invisible. You know, we, they, 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 they were maybe acknowledged passively, but they certainly weren't big voices. They weren't, they weren't part of our regular media diet. So the question is, how do we fix that? One, th one, it's a good question, and I don't know how we fix it. But one of the ways is more diversity, obviously. I think because, as I said, when you bring older women into the mix as broadcasters, you bring their experience with them, and you will do the same when you bring different ethnicities as well. Mm. But I think one of the things about reportage in the last week or so, or week and yeah, last week or so around the Muslim attacks is because there hasn't been the focus on the perpetrator, and there has been a, a very concentrated focus on the victims, that's how we've learned so much about mm. Muslims and, and mm. Islam. Mm. Uh, we had a couple of Americans staying with us over the last week or so, and, and that was one point that they picked up. They said if this had happened in America, the focus would have been on the perpetrator, and it would have been on the gun laws, and it would have been on all that side of the issue, but instead we've had a focus on the ethnicity and, and the victims. And what I've loved, uh, particularly in the reporting on this too, is your average Kiwi bloke that I've heard on radio, actually, I haven't seen many of them on telly, saying, I don't know anything about Muslims, but I went into a mosque today. And mm. there's been, and to hear someone that's normally so, so dyed in the wool, you can't teach an old dog new tricks stuff, you know, probably a generation older than mm. me, saying that kind of stuff has been really, really powerful. Mm. Um, and so that's a positive thing that we've seen, I, I think, I in the last mm. week or so. That's a really great example. I th I th yes, question here. Sorry, I just was wanted to just go back to uh, a kind of earlier bigger problem that I see with all of it, um, frankly, <laughs> is that I've become one of those people, and I'm pretty sure I'm not alone, who will check social media in the first instance mm. for my news. And I will rely on people sharing news stories. I don't go to the Stuff homepage. Mm. I don't go to the Herald homepage. I will go to the Guardian occasionally, I'll, I'll, but mostly I'll go to Facebook or Twitter to see who's sharing stories that I will be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm pretty sure that I'm not, I'm not alone in that, and I know that um, young people don't even use Facebook anymore. So um, my concern is that, yes, we've seen a lot of really good 
commentary from the last week and a lot of really responsible journalism from those, uh, from our big players. And, and perhaps that's been partly because the eyes of the rest of the world have been on us and everybody's mm -hmm. lifted the bar and done really, really well. But I was quite horrified just yesterday to see, again, my own laziness, but um, up on my news feed uh, was a, a New Zealand Herald story mm -hmm. uh, about, and, the, and they'd written, um, you know, oh wow, I can't believe anyone would do this. And the story was about a girl using social media. So the story was about a girl overseas live streaming herself licking the seat of the lavatory on an aeroplane. This was a story that the New Zealand Herald felt was worth publishing two days ago, and it, and there it was. Um, now that's clearly clickbait. It's not news. It's not newsworthy. It's you know, and and the fact that they wrote "ooh gross," you know, above it doesn't lessen the fact that they bothered writing about it and 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 uploading it mm -hmm. onto a platform where people mm -hmm. are going to where it's going to arrive on people's feeds because that is. Sadly or not, the way that I suspect a lot of us are now actually receiving our news. We don't open the paper. Mm -hmm. We may still tune in and record the evening news. We certainly record it every night, but we don't watch it go out live. Um, and so I think we've got a bigger problem in that, in that the, the staffs and the heralds and the, and the media works and all these guys need to actually be more careful with what constitutes news. And the idea of there being another side isn't necessarily another side. It's just a, a clearly clickbait. And I'll, I would put the Brian Tamaki conversation into that in the last couple of days. I'm not sure why he was approached for comment about anything. Um, because it didn't help and it just raised all those issues again for people. And I think there's a responsibility to be aware that most of us who use social media are actually using it as a way to find our other news as well. Do you want to respond to anyone? Prefer not to, but because um, <laughs> I agree. Um, look, I, when I said that I was, you, you've got to give plaudits and credit to the media for what they've done over the last week. I mean it. Except, um, let me give you an example on the call for prayer. Some of the behaviour of the media at that event was horrendous. Um, wanting to get out of the media commentary area, taking cameras into the prayer area to get shots of Sonny Bill praying. Uh, trying to get behind the imam, which is a, a, a clear space. Right? Trying to get into the women, men, camera, trying to take little handy cams to get into the women's area, which is for, which, according to the imam, was for women only, to get shots that no one else could get. And then the, the behavior to those volunteers who were there, who were called in, by the way, within 24 hours for that particular event, um, city council staff who were there for trying to be security guards to try and hold people in, agreed upon by the Muslim community leaders, Christian city council, government, all that kind of stuff, DPS squad. Their behaviour was horrendous. Um, the story that I saw about the, the two um, um, Destiny Church guys who were there refusing to bow in the space and all, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, these things were... That was particular segments of the media behaving poorly, inappropriately, and they're ours, by the way. They weren't, they weren't international media, they, they were our guys. These were, these were our guys who were trying to push, push the barriers and, and, and push their, their, their little wares. So, so I haven't got an answer to that, I've kind of added on to it, except that um, all these reporters report to someone and they are our, in our media organisations. And, um, and you know, um, that kind of thing is like sugar, and unfortunately, we are all flies. Mm. And I don't know how you stop that. And the other argument there is, is it chicken and egg? And this is something that I have an issue sometimes. You know, if I'm pitching a story through my PR business, I'm actually quite gobsmacked. Sometimes that stuff doesn't get picked up when I see what is run on that page instead. Mm -hmm. um, same sort of thing. But I mean, we often hear, um, you know, the, the argument that we're producing what people want to see. Yeah. And what people want to see is yeah. what we're producing. Mm. And so you start to wonder where you need to break into that cycle yeah. and circle. Well, that's why we're talking about responsibility. To stop, yeah. Yeah, 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 but it's a hard thing to do when you've got algorithms, when you've got things. You know, my husband said to me when we were overseas recently, he said, 
wow, because we were in Munich or somewhere, and he started getting ads on his Facebook page for, page for buying sauerkraut and sausages or whatever it was. And he said, how the hell are they doing that? And it was, you know, I mean, he, and it's because of that sort of stuff. And that is really freaky. So I don't know how you deal with that with the technology. Mm, that's perhaps highly fun. Yeah, yeah, well, well, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, exactly. One thing as well, just about Donald was mentioning before about not throwing the baby out of the bathwater. I think when you're talking about getting your news from social media, it's worth remembering it's not all bad. No. Um, especially with uh, developing stories, a huge example for me would be uh, the green movement in Iran about five or six years ago. Uh, the government was actively trying to suppress what was going on, and it was Twitter was the big place mm -hmm. where you'd find mm -hmm. out uh, th this is the amount of people on the street. This is how much they really oppose this government. Um, and you know, no mainstream outlet, no no and government outlet was going to get that to us. So without embarrassing this one too much, during the sorry, but <coughs> this is interesting that during the lockdown, through a strange series of events which were actually quite amusing, he ended up locked in the bathroom on his own with a rubbish phone that was flared, and so he turned it on, saw a, a little message from me come up just saying oh, you're in lockdown and in the phone in bed. Um, so he didn't know why or where oh, or what wow. was happening or what the time was. Um, and it turned out, oh, were you not in there? With no, oh, and he could hear the choppers, hear the sirens, hear muffled footsteps, chit chat, you know, loudness. Were softness. you worried when you didn't hear back from him or couldn't hear back? No, because I know he's got a rubbish oh, phone. Yeah. It didn't occur to me on the other side. No, I often don't hear back from him. <laughs> 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 it's maybe it's a bit right. One can um, deal with Facebook, could be Facebook on a 104 year old female. It must really <laughs> confuse their algorithms. I don't know if that's a So, what ads do you get? <laughs> Well, once I delete the media. Yeah, we're going to have to uh, wrap up yeah. the proceedings. There's uh, maybe time for a couple of very quick last questions. So, sure. Yeah, just a response to the, um, the idea that we, uh, we produce what we want to see. And people see it. People, you know, if we produce what we want to see, is the reason for clickbait with these sort of trashy things that they're trying to get to go viral. The, my question then is, if a newspaper held a poll of its subscribers, would they all be voting for the girl on the airplane or the toilet seat? And the answer is no. So people don't actually want to see that. Clickbait is a tool that's used for a very specific reason, which is to attempt to achieve virality and drive massive amounts of traffic to a website yeah. to increase page views and, their, and increase profit with as little expenditures on real journalism as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is a very cheap and very easy way to try to attempt to to, to essentially, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that truly democratically controlled institutions do not uh, produce clickbait, they produce quality content. And so I'll, pu I'll push back gently on this idea. I'm not suggesting that corporations are evil, I'm simply saying that we have to be clear-eyed about incentives. Yeah. And everybody understand very deeply that the incentives underlying the decisions Facebook makes and the decisions our media makes are driven by the sense which they are privately controlled. And so if we can get more broad-based ownership and more broad-based democratic control of our institutions, we will see positive improvements. And that's not to say that capitalism is evil or that corporations are evil, but simply to say that you know we can have both coexisting and we understand intuitively what the pros and cons should be. Well, there well, is a pretty, pretty sorry, clear though. correlation in, in academic literature that in, in countries that have strong public service media traditions and institutions uh, that people are, are better informed and more, make more critical judgments about uh, which things to, to click on and so on. Um, so some of these are factors of the, mm -hmm. uh, the hyper-commercialized media environment. Absolutely. Well, I think Which is we a plug for your organization. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. We'll Sounds pay you later. Too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll have to wrap things up, but I'll, 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 I'll leave you on a hopeful note. There was a, a meeting actually we had in Wellington last week, and there was a young, young man there who was a student who uh, um, actually said that all, all of his uh, news came from his feed on his mobile phone. Um, and then uh, uh, Ruth Harley, the uh, chair of uh, New Zealand Air, was there, actually said, well, what did you do when you heard about the, the Christchurch you know, massacre going on? And he said, I went to RNZ. <laughs> so there was hope. <laughs> anyway.
Um, we, we'll have to call our proceedings to, uh, to an end, so a very, very big thank you to Julian Wilcox, Ali Jones, Matt Orchard and Dr Donald Matteson. Thank you very much.